The way I became uh, acquainted with this whole exotic idea of transhumanism, uh, I was doing research actually. I was a writer and doing research for one of the largest U.S. newspapers out of Oklahoma. And this is maybe 20 some years ago. And doing research on the history of Halloween of all things and somewhere I came across a term that I had never seen before called transgenics. Now, I didn't know what transgenics was, but you know, I could kind of put two and two together. Trans, genes, that somehow we're talking here about genetic engineering, the altering of genes. And I became fascinated with this idea because back then the science was brand new. It was not, you know, biotechnology, nanotechnology. These were not even terms that existed. But it was following on the heels of the mapping of the human genome which then was giving both the birth to a promise uh, and also to the sciences that we are going to be able to do things with genetics. We'll be able to heal our bodies, we'll be able to make ourselves stronger. Uh, there was a great deal of promise that was emerging quickly and the science to back it up at least in theory. And so I started doing research into transgenics and at the time it wasn't very easy to get information. The internet was brand new. Uh, certainly the science wasn't old enough for there to be much, you know, that had been published in peer-reviewed journals. And I wanted to know what is the good and what is the bad and what is transgenics. And I came to understand that transgenics was simply the crossing over of species barriers. Uh, this could be done at the level of just organisms. This could be done all the way up to the level of sentient beings. That you could literally blend one kind of a creature with another creature. Uh, what would be, what we, why would we want to do that? What would be the purpose behind it? That was what motivated me. And quickly I began to realize that both the military and also the pharmaceutical industry both had an interest in transgenics. The military because they thought they might be able to create exotic new forms of uh, materials that could be used. For instance, one of the first successes was a project that was funded by DARPA, the Defense Advanced Research Projects Agency, in which they created transgenic goat uh, spiders, actually spider goats. Uh, and the reason that they did this was because they knew that spider silk is amazingly resilient, lightweight, but very strong, and yet it's not very easy, you know, to, to create a spider farm where you can milk spiders for their silk. Uh, but they knew that they could do this with goats and so that one of the first successes in transgenics was creating a goat which was part spider. It could actually grow spider silk in its milk and then they could use this for making lightweight bulletproof vests, they could use it for creating cargo nets. Um, but since that time until now as we may discover later on in this discussion, um, it, it has become far more sophisticated in terms of the military's interest and the amount of dollars that are flowing into uh, research that grew out of those early forms of transgenic science. Uh, all the other side of transgenics, which is probably the biggest part of where the funding is coming from today, is in the pharmaceutical industry. Uh, pharmaceuticals, why? Because um, the industry often has to labor with uh, the FDA to try to get permission to do testing of new drug therapies on human subjects. It's very daunting, that task, to try to get uh, you know, a promising new uh, remedy uh, potentially for some kind of debilitating disease and then to be able to take and start trying that medicine, which is unproven on human test subjects, is not easy to do. Well, the pharmaceutical industry saw right away that they would be able to take animals and put human DNA into the animals, create a human-animal chimera, and then they could work around this problem with getting permission from federal agencies to do a human experimentation and now they could test new drugs in human animal chimeras to see how the human elements of that creature might respond in a way that they're hoping for with these uh, drug therapies. And that too has also grown a great deal since those original transgenic experiments uh, in that uh, now of course what the public most usually hear, uh, hears about is human-animal chimeras that are being created for the purposes of developing stem cell lines and then the stem cell lines can be used for testing uh, new therapies in hopes that we're going to lead to cures uh, for a variety of human diseases and ailments. Anyway, it was the discovery 
of transgenics and my interest in why uh, we would have an interest in funding research into crossing over species barriers that then led me to discover that behind these emerging fields of science was a new cultural movement called transhumanism. And transhumanists are made up today really of all walks of life. Everything from college kids to old hippies uh, to academics and professionals. It has become a cultural movement and it's quickly growing. It's international. Today there's a Christian transhumanist association, there's a Buddhist transhumanist association, there's a Muslim transhumanist, there's a Mormon transhumanist, and then there's just a transhumanist transhumanist <laughs> association. And for whatever reason, I've had the privilege of somehow becoming connected with some of the leading figures in the world in this area. In fact, Dr. James Hughes, who was the president of the World Transhumanist Association, when he was still the head of the WTA, contacted me and asked if I would come on his syndicated radio show, which is called Change Surfer Radio. Dr. Hughes is a bioethicist. He teaches at uh, Trinity College in Hartford, Connecticut. He's a sociologist. Uh, he was and is really the man, the top shelf, if you will. So I agreed to do his show. And I went on his show uh, and not very well prepared either, but to debate the, bio, uh, the ethics of crossing over species in, uh, barriers in ways that are completely unnatural. And why would we want to do that? Now, of course, as a Christian, and I would probably still consider myself a conservative Christian, uh, I believe in a divine order. In other words, I believe that God was at the beginning of creation and God, for whatever reasons, placed barriers between the species and ordered that each kind would only reproduce after its own kind. So in the back of my mind, of course, I want to know what does God know that we don't know? Why did he do that? But then I would say that even if you didn't believe in divine creation, uh, if you are an evolutionist, what we are doing now was not allowed for by evolution either. Natural selection has not done what we are now doing. And so for me it was a cause for alarm that, you know, they talk about throwing off the balance of nature. We were talking about doing it in ways that a former generation could not have even imagined. So today the World Transhumanist Association had an original cause. It was really to bring international attention to the idea that through emerging fields of science we would soon be able to alter what it means to be a human, literally rewrite our DNA, alter ourselves by altering our genetic makeup, create humans, Homo sapiens 2.0. Uh, the movement today is, is often called H+, which just simply means humans plus. A transhuman is in a transitionary uh, state of being. They are human. They are wanting to transition into something else, but ultimately they want to become a post-human, something that has become so radically altered from what we are today as to no longer even be considered to be human. And uh, they imagine uh, creating Homo sapien 2.0 through the use of technology from neuropharmacology to nanotechnology, uh, genetic engineering, stem cell sciences, robotic assistance, brain machine interfacing, all of the new fields of science that could have an application for human enhancement is important to the transhumanist movement. Now the World Transhumanist Association had an original goal of bringing international attention to the movement and there was a point at which they believed that they had succeeded at doing that and so they dropped the World Transhumanist Association name and changed it to the IEET, the Institute for Ethics and Emerging Technology. Uh, Dr. Hughes is also now the CEO or the president of the IEET and most of the most well-known names in the world that are also involved in transhumanism such as Nick Bostrom of Oxford University are chairs or members of the IEET. So somehow, I, I never uh, you know, set out to somehow become involved as the nemesis, if you will, of the transhumanist movement and I've actually became friends with people like Dr. Hughes. He has since been on my radio show. Uh, we recently did a series where we were talking about the question, are we alone in the universe, which was raised by the Royal Academy of Scientists out of the UK. 
And we had him come on and he talked about, uh, you know, future space travel from a transhumanist point of view and how our bodies could be enhanced to make us more adaptable to zero gravity states and things like that. So, but the movement is very serious and it's being taken very serious uh, in the world today from academia to university studies and you'll be surprised to find out uh, the amount of revenue in the in literally in the tens of millions to the billions of dollars that are flowing into this futuristic dream of transhumanism now and the adaptation of various fields of science which will be used in the very near future to alter what it means to be a human. The science is being developed now according to the world's best and government experts. Uh, it's being tested in laboratory settings and is slowly being adapted so that it can be used as a tool for actually altering what it means to be a human. Uh, with regards to who would be funding, who has an interest, uh, that's where it begins to become really surprising and, is, and it actually is not too difficult to verify even from secular but reputable news sources. For instance, if you were to go to Google today and type in transhumanism, you would find something like 250,000 web pages now around the world that are dedicated to both the study, philosophy, but this world, new world view called transhumanism. However, if you were to type in genetic engineering laboratories, you'd find more than 24 million websites in the world now dedicated to the subject of genetic engineering, which is of course one of the sciences that the transhumanists uh, believe, aspire to believe that uh, this is gonna be used to alter what it means to be a human. Now, on the ground, what does it mean? Here in the United States of America, you may remember where a few years ago, 2006 I believe, George W. Bush in a State of the Union address called for legislation to be enacted that would prohibit the creation of human animal chimeras. And he wasn't just talking about embryos for experimentation because he also talked about prohibiting the creation of, of uh, exotic human life forms that could be patented. Why would the President of the United States, in a, in a speech of record, be calling for legislation that would prohibit this technology? It's because it's emerging very quickly. And we know now that there are those rogue scientists, wannabes, the, the Dr. Moreau's, who are already raising these to full maturity. And we can come to some of those admissions in this interview as well. For example, one of the first things that President Obama did at the executive level as soon as he became president, he overturned restrictions that had been put in place by President Bush, which would have prohibited federal dollars, uh, American taxpayer money, flowing in to pay for experiments to be done on human animal chimeras and other forms of science such as stem cell sciences, which is also important to the transhumanist movement. But what most of the public doesn't realize, when we're talking about stem cell sciences, we're almost always talking about the creation of a human animal chimera from which those stem cells are being derived. But now tax dollars in the United States uh, from the federal level are flowing into thousands, thousands of laboratories. In the state that I live in, in Missouri, for instance, there is a farm that is raising transgenic pigs that are part human. They're using these pigs to actually grow organs in a test uh, in the hopes that these humanized organs in the pigs can then be transplanted into uh, people who are on donor waiting lists. Now, you know, years ago, they called this xenotransplantation and they had hoped to just uh, implant entire pig organs inside humans, but the, the human bodies in the tests kept wanting to reject these pig organs. Now though, with human DNA actually growing inside of a pig, we may be able to create an organ that can solve this problem of organ donation. But that kind of funding from the federal level now is flowing into states in a way that had been prohibited under the Bush administration. But it goes deeper. In 2006, a fantastic thing happened. The Department of Health, which is the largest department in the United States of America, which funds research into health issues, provided $773,000 to Case Law School in Cleveland, Ohio, for one reason, to develop over a 24-month period the guidelines that will be used, according to their own press release at Case Law School, used for creating policy, 
for human enhancement regarding the next step in human evolution. Max Melhelm, who is the uh, law professor and a bioethicist at Case Law School, was given the responsibility of leading the team of 24 uh, uh, to 36 months field study, if you will, using actual test subjects. Human subjects, according to the original press release, would be used for devising how policy, government policy, uh, can be extended to human non-humans. Well, because this started in 2006, and we knew that the target ending date for this study, which was being done not just by Max Melhelm, but law professors, bioethicists, genetic engineers, uh, people who work in the fields of genetic alteration, that within 24 months to 36 months this field study would be done, 2009 was the target date for the report to be issued. So I waited with bated breath. In what way did Case Law School actually use human test subjects to provide what the government wants, guidelines to be used for human enhancement to set the policy for how, for instance, will the Constitution, how will the Bill of Rights be extended to a human non-human? How much of uh, a living entity has to be human before it can be protected under our laws. Must it be 90% human and 10% something else, 50% human? So I wanted to know, well, the end of the test came and no public statements have been forthcoming. But what I noticed was that Professor uh, Melhelm now, immediately at the end of the study, started traveling the United States giving lectures at universities, and he's giving two different lectures, and this is the title of his lectures. One is called Directed Evolution, Public Policy and Human Enhancement. And the second lecture he's given now is Transhumanism and the Future of Democracy. And you can go to the Arizona State University, and that second lecture is actually available as a podcast. You can download the lecture unless they remove it from the time this film is made uh, until the time somebody might go there to download it, but you can actually go and download it. So here you not only have the President of the United States loosing federal funds to go into research on human animal chimeras, stem cell lines, uh, various kinds of uh, laboratory experiments on humans that could then be applied later on down the road through a transhumanist philosophy, the use of those technologies, but it's actually being funded through the U.S. Department of Health to actually set the policy and guidelines for how the law will be applied to human non-humans. It even goes deeper. The Defense Advanced Research Projects Agency, DARPA, has for over the last decade been funding to the tune literally of billions of dollars research into what they call the Extended Performance Warfighter. They have since removed the document, the original document, on the Extended Performance Warfighter program from DARPA's own website but a person can Google and find the same articles uh, that were originally published being cached across the internet. The interesting parts about the extended performance warfighter is that it even includes literally altering the DNA of soldiers. You, the public may more commonly hear this referred to as super soldier technology. But it got interesting this year. The 2011 budget for DARPA, which can be downloaded at Wired Magazine if a person wants to go and read the uh, DARPA budget, allows millions of dollars for what they are calling biodesign. Biodesign is actually outlined in the budget. The purpose of it has to do with immortalism. The purpose of it is to literally discover how cellular destruction occurs and why in regeneration of cellular decay, we as humans don't wind up at 100% again, and we begin to age. And DARPA has an interest in figuring out how to get around the decaying process of cellular life. And they use the term, creating an immortal organism. But it's more than just an organism. They consider it to be potentially a lethal force that can be used in military application. Wired Magazine actually referred to it as a living, breathing creature. And DARPA uh, admits that the force of this living creature, this immortal organism, could be so potent that it ought to also have what they call a kill switch uh, introduced uh, into its organism 
so that in case it gets out of hand, we could throw the switch and stop it, or if it became available to our enemies, uh, we could throw the, the switch and stop it. So that in the United States, we know that from the federal level, under Obama, revenue is flowing into this research. We know that from the U.S. Department of Health, revenue is flowing into this research from the Defense Advanced Research Projects Agency. And if a person wants to do their homework, they'll find out that it's also the Air Force, the Navy, the Army. All of our military laboratories are funding now to the tunes of millions and billions of dollars research into fields that also include the altering of their soldiers for the purposes of having total battlefield domination in the future. But a person should also be aware that this technology is not just limited to the United States of America. In Australia, in China, in Great Britain, all around the world, literally tens of thousands of laboratories are receiving both federal and private funding for this kind of research. In the United States, even when Bush had called for uh, restrictions on federal funding, it didn't stop the research here. It simply was being done through private grants and private dollars. There were no laws that were stopping people from doing human-animal research here. But now it starts to get really interesting in that even the scientific community is making admissions, uh, which of course I was uh, suspicious of anyway for some time. There was a Reuters article about six months ago called Scientists Want Debate on Animals with Human Genes. And it turns out that the scientists that were being interviewed were the same scientists that 24 months ago were involved in what was called the human embryology discussions out of Great Britain. Laboratories wanted to receive federal funding, uh, public money, to finance their investigations and experiments which included altering humans and altering animals, at least at the embryonic stage. And there was such public outcry in Britain about it that the government decided to have a public forum. And they allowed different people, ethicists, bioethicists, even religious scholars, to weigh in on the question of whether or not it would be ethical to begin altering humans at, of course, in the beginning, the embryonic level, but later on perhaps to full maturity. At the end of those discussions, and there were some very interesting things during the discussions, by the way, for instance, the Vatican had two bishops present during these discussions, and the two bishops for the Vatican uh, weighed in saying that if a woman participated in these experiments by providing eggs or ovum, and then later if she had uh, a conflict of conscience and decided that she wanted to raise this half-human, half-animal, as her own child that she ought to have the right to do so. And I believe that the, the Vatican's bishops were not really making that argument in sincerity as much as they were trying to illustrate the tortured ethics, the kind of unanswerable questions about do they have a soul. Uh, in Israel, some of the religious scholars in Israel uh, have weighed in, talking about if we create a transgenic animal or clone a transgenic animal and it is part cow, how much of it would need to be human before it would be protected under our laws, and or if the majority of it was cow, could we then offer it as a burnt sacrifice? So, illustrating once again that there, is, there really isn't any way to wrap any kind of Judeo-Christian ethic around what we are now doing, but it hasn't stopped us from doing it. Well, those scientists who have been receiving funding now from the British government for the past 24 months are back. And the Reuters headline, scientists want debate on, uh, want public debate on animals with human genes, was very specific in that they want to know how far the public now would be willing to let them go. And there were two things in this Reuters article that were very telling. One, the scientists themselves admitting that among the scientists involved in this research, they are comfortable now with up to 50% human-animal integration. See, the public mostly is still under the impression that this is being done at the embryonic level and that the amount of human DNA in a transgenic animal is so minute as to be excusable. Well, what we learned in this article is it is up to at least 50% human-animal integration and that the scientists involved with it are comfortable. But where they want the debate to go now is, 
can we raise these to full maturity in the public's knowledge and experiment on part humans, part animals that are fully grown. And by admitting that that's now where they want the public to be comfortable with this research, they also said that they knew that there are some rogue scientists out there that are not operating with federal dollars and they're getting ahead of them in this technology. And it could even become a, a new kind of a weapon of mass destruction. Uh, it, could, it could at a minimum become a molecular biological nightmare because now by crossing over species barriers in ways that neither evolution nor God allowed for, uh, we are completely uncertain about how when this gets out of the box where it may lead us. To answer the question, what would be the benefits of transhumanism through the eyes of a transhumanist? I can tell you because some of them are my friends and I have had the opportunity to debate with them. And when I say friends, I don't mean that I share their worldview whatsoever, but we have, um, you know, cordial conversations. It's diplomatic. And, and I believe in the sincerity, for instance, of men like Dr. James Hughes. Uh, Dr. Hughes would never advocate for anything, I think, that, that he believed would be detrimental to the future of society. So uh, much of their ideas are altruistic in the sense that they're, they're selfless and they're perceived to be for the good of society as a whole. For instance, longevity. One of the key objectives of transhumanism is to extend our lifespans. Uh, uh, people who are either transhumanists or who are friendly to the transhuman vision such as Aubrey de Grey who is a member of the Methuselah Foundation. The whole commitment of which is to either through diet or even more advanced applications such as genetic engineering learn how to do things that will bring about the end of human suffering and disease and therefore lead to longer lifespans. Uh, learn how through genetic engineering, for instance, to perhaps turn off what is happening when tumorous cancers are growing in our bodies. Uh, so that not only do they intend to um, enjoy the benefits of longer life in the future as transhumans, um, uh, Aubrey de Grey is saying now that if you're 50 years of age, when you're watching this video, there's a very good chance you could live to be as much as 1,000 years old. Uh, with how quickly this science and technology is advancing. But the transhumans don't just want to extend life because as you know, some people watching this might say, you know what, why would I even want to live to be a thousand years old? I'm kind of ready to get out of here now, you know, with the way that the world is going. So the transhumanists also consider that. And uh, it's not just a longer life, but it's a happier life. It's a healthier life where we're stronger and we've been enhanced cognitively. Uh, through neurosciences now, we're learning things about the brain. We're learning uh, the portion of the brain that leads to depression also leads to euphoria. And if we could learn how to control those portions of the brain, we may develop natural treatments for persons so that they could be happier, so that they could escape from depression. So uh, that would be one of their ideas. Of course, enhancing our bodies so that we're stronger. Uh, the elimination of pain. You know, right now I go out and dig a hole and within one hour, man, I'm ready for some cold tea and a place to throw up my feet. But these future enhanced bodies would be able to perform uh, at levels that, uh, you know, perhaps only 25-year-old weightlifters right now do it. And we would be talking about people who may be 150 years of age that can run for miles. Also cognitive enhancement so that we not only eradicate diseases such as Alzheimer's, but we actually are able to modify the brain in ways where it is enhanced to be able to think at um, you know, teraflops faster than we can now and also to be able to even uh, interface with uh, um, computer systems of the future, sort of like the matrix, you know. Plug in, download, and all of a sudden I know Kung Fu. So, uh, and these are perceived to be true benefits uh, to humanity. We have better lives uh, and we're better off as a result. Now, they also have some very exotic ideas about future humans and why they would be happy in particular ways. For instance, uh, among transhumans is a segment that's called post-genderism. 
Post-genderism actually has grown out of the feminist side of the transhumanist movement. And as you know, feminists have been at war with their gender identities and the roles that uh, you know, society places on them for some time. Uh, some among the feminist movement also believe that it's a little bit unfair that, you know, uh, they get pregnant and they're the ones that have to carry the baby and, and lose the shape of their body uh, and then travail and give birth where the man can enjoy the benefits of sex, uh, but he doesn't have to go through this whole nine month gestation period. So in transhumanism, there are some very exotic ideas such as post-genderism, the idea that we will be able to develop androgynous beings, uh, morphological beings, who will take the best of what it means to be a man and the best of what it means to be a woman and actually have a new form of life that is both man and woman who can enjoy the benefits of things uh, such as sex, which I mentioned a moment ago, but without the burden of having to become pregnant having to carry a child for nine months. And so uh, if, you, if you look into some of their uh, ideas, uh, you know, where do babies come from? If don't these future humans want to have genetic offspring? And they've developed ideas around how all this could be done uh, within their science. Uh, you take genetic samples, and this isn't altogether cloning, but you take genetic samples from the contributors, man, woman, A, and man, woman, B, or future marriages may be made up of multiple numbers. Maybe there's 18 or 20 that have entered into what we would then think of as a marriage contract. And those ones that want genetic offspring can all provide samples of their genetics. And then this is taken to a, a specialized pregnancy center or birthing center of the future. And through some form of super in, uh, in vitro fertilization, those genetic samples are placed inside of an egg which has had its nucleus removed, which is also probably donated from one of these men women. It is um, treated with chemicals or with electricity like we do with cloning now. And it jump starts, spindle formation, cells begin to divide and a new man woman made up of multiple uh, partners uh, begins to grow and becomes an embryo. And if that sounds incredible to you, in Britain just this week, the first baby from three parents was born. The science has already been perfected. We're already doing it. It's not as if this is as futuristic as it may sound. We're just at the, we're at the beginning of the gate now, but we've come through the door. The gate is open and we're walking through it and we're moving that direction. And they're uh, 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 imagining how this science could be used in ways that in their mind, is beneficial to humanity. We no longer have the burden of gender roles. Now, what do psychologists, uh, you know, say about a baby? Very, uh, how a baby is bonded to its mother while it's growing up inside of its mother's womb is almost mystical. It's metaphysical. We don't understand it. A baby is born and even already knows the tone of its mother's voice. Well, transhumanists have an answer for that too. Postgenderists believe that they also take genetic samples from whichever of the men women want to play the role of the traditional mother and they grow a synthetic womb inside the birthing center and it is hooked to an androidal system that also has the sound of the mother's voice recorded in it and this androidal system can stand up sit down move around make uh, natural movements that feels very natural to the embryo that is growing up inside of it so that by the time nine months later and, and even that is a question because these future humans may not take nine months to gestate. But if they do, you go to the birthing center and the, the switch is thrown, the little baby is born, it's grown up inside its mother's womb because it was taken from her genetics and recreated in a laboratory. It has grown up listening to the sound of her voice and her heartbeat, all of which are a part of this future system. Did you know that some of the early discussions actually uh, were around creating clones who would then be anesthetized, not even aware that they're alive, and their wombs would be used for gestating these children, and then afterward, the, cl the clone, if not legally defined as a human, could be discarded. It would simply be a system for saving man, woman, A, from the burden of having to carry a child. But many of the, of, uh, even within the transhumanist, you know, philosophical community, uh, simply couldn't tolerate that idea and so they advanced it to growing a synthetic womb which w could then be used for the gestation period. Uh, one of the other benefits that transhumanists imagine actually borderlines on the supernatural 
And this started really with Nick Bostrom, who is a, a leading transhumanist in the world, sits on the IEET's board uh, under Dr. James Hughes. Nick Bostrom actually earned his prestigious seat at Oxford University by writing his thesis on transhumanist values. And thankfully for the rest of us, uh, Dr. Um, Bostrom has been kind enough to post his theses and other works that he has done. So anybody who would want to follow up on this could go to nickbostrom.com, pull down the website on the left side and click on Transhumanist Values and go and read his original theses, which he wrote to earn his PhD and his seat at Oxford University. It's interesting because uh, Bostrom doesn't claim any kind of religious ideology, but he has diagrams in there that he uses when he gives his lectures at universities and also at the Transvision conferences, which are taking place every year now for about the past decade at leading uh, law schools and universities around the world in which the um, arguments are being um, detailed now, worked out among law sco uh, scholars on how the uh, laws and policy of our government will be extended to protect transhumans of the future and future democracy. But if you, if you click on it and you look at some of the charts that he has created, for instance he has one that's kind of a large rectangle. And in this rectangle, he describes this rectangle as representing all uh, possible modes of perception modalities, sensory modalities. Down in the corner he draws a small circle and he says this circle represents humans. The limits of our perception, modes of perception or sensory modalities, our eyesight, hearing, taste, feeling, and how far it extends into all possible modes of perception. Then around that he draws a larger circle and he says this is the animal kingdom. The animal kingdom not only has our level of perception, but, but other levels of perception. For instance, uh, they can hear at higher decibels than we can. Dogs at 40,000 hertz, uh, dolphins at something like 80,000 hertz. Some animals like bats can navigate using sonar. They also seem to be in touch with the earth somehow in ways that we're not. Uh, they can pick up vibrations, they'll begin to move out of particular areas when they know there's going to be an earthquake or there's going to be a volcano and they'll begin to migrate to another area and we're not exactly sure how they do that. Uh, they may be able to smell tumors and if it's not smelling it, it's some other method by which sometimes they are aware that there is a tumorous cancer, something that is actually degrading your DNA. So he talks about these fascinating things but then he says something that I think is of the most importance and borderlines the metaphysical. And that is when he points out that animals can also see into areas of the light spectrum that we cannot see into. And, uh, and that is viewed in transhumanism as a future benefit and even one of the causal reasons we would want to merge ourselves with the animal kingdom so that we can open these new modes of perception into realities that right now we are blinded to. Uh, perhaps one of the reasons we would want to merge ourselves with animals so that we too would be able to do this. Why this is interesting to me as a Christian and as a researcher uh, and as a scholar of, of biblical texts is because we know that animals can see into, at least some animals can see into, what we think of as the supernatural realm. And it isn't just extra biblical texts that seem to imply this, but even in the Bible. For instance, the story of Balaam's donkey. Balaam gets in trouble because he's prophesying against Israel, which he's been ordered, you know, by God not to do. And so now he's on his donkey and he's going down the road. Well, the donkey can see something that Balaam cannot see. There's a large angel standing in the middle of the road with its sword drawn and it's going to take off dumb Balaam's head and Balaam doesn't know why the donkey keeps turning out of the way and so he keeps kicking him to get him back on the road and the donkey's trying to save his life. A great deal of, of extra biblical research has also been done that seems to show that animals sometimes are responding to something uh, that we can't see. In fact, probably the average person, at least at one time in their life, have saw their dog 
growling at something that isn't there, as far as we can tell, or maybe even behaving in a way. You have a dog that's vicious, it's brave, it's not afraid of anything, and then all of a sudden, a strange feeling comes over you, and the dog senses it too, or the dog may even run and hide under the bed. So they seem to be reacting to something that we can't see with our eyes. And in the traditions and in the histories of the world, um, owls come, and owls serve with the goddess Hecate, the goddess of witchcraft. Uh, other uh, areas of uh, witchcraft where cats are used as mediums through which we are communicating with the spirit world. That idea has been with humanity since forever, but what made it real to me, of course, is the depiction out of the Bible, at least in one illustration, where an animal can see something the humans cannot see. That is definitely in the back of the mind of many of these transhumanists. And they are bravely wanting to go where no modern man has gone before in breaching that barrier that is between us and them. This is so true that now the Templeton Foundation which has been funding an entire series of lectures over the last several years at the Arizona State University on transhumanism and the future of democracy, have played off of what uh, Dr. Bostrom began talking about and many of what the university students are now, now asking about, uh, how do we separate our humanity? If we change ourselves physiologically, we enhance ourselves to humans 2.0, do we also change our soul? Do we change our spirit? Do we even have a spirit anymore? And as these questions are being entertained, Arizona State University began a brand new project. You can go to ASU's website and you can click on it. It's called the Sophia Project, the Goddess of Wisdom. The Sophia Project, some believe even to be that feminine aspect of God, right? And it describes exactly what the SOFIA project is, is about. It is to verify and or to make contact with, and then they describe it, the ghosts of dead humans, aliens, angels, demons, a universal conscious, God. They list all of it, the whole purpose behind the project, growing out of transhuman, transhumanist conversations and debates and lectures being offered at the Arizona State University and funded by the Templeton Foundation, want to take this whole question of altering our, ourselves as humans forward to this next giant question. By doing so, can we also now cross over? Can we start communicating with that unseen intelligence? So this too is viewed as a value among transhumans. Many of them are spiritual, and many of them see that as a benefit. While well, some of these exotic ideas in transhumanism, of course, where it may be being viewed by them as a benefit, may cause a lot of red flags to go up among other people who also are interested in things supernatural. There are some of the critics, of course, of uh, transhumanism who believe that their worldview is a bit uh, too uh, positive, you know, that they view this as being a utopian plan that's going to take us into the future. We're all going to live in a happy universe and have enhanced lives. Uh, but there are those who are also qualified to make criticisms based on the science itself and what it may portend to do. For instance, Dr. Leon Cass was the chairman of the President's Council on Bioethics during the Bush administration. And here is a man who had the, the, the full review of the science, the best reports on the science, uh, testimony from experts who were working in these fields of science and what they believed could actually develop out of transforming mankind. And after Dr. Cass had served on that seat with the government. He resigned, he wrote a book, and in the introduction to his book, Life, Liberty, and the uh, Defense of Dignity, he wrote how that in laboratories around the world, scientists are now honing their skills, polishing their skills, looking forward to a post-human future, and that humanity is on the operating table, literally, scheduled for wholesale psychic and physiological redesign, while on the streets, the evangelists, he refers to them as, not transhumans, the evangelists are quietly selling their message and that we are in a war for the mind of a generation 
Uh, and Dr. Cass believes we're probably going to lose this war, but he says that anybody who cares about their humanity, the time is now for standing up and understanding where science is taking us and what it may portend for the future. He's not the only one. Professor Francis Fukuyama uh, reviewed emerging fuels of science and then the philosophy of transhumanism. And he wrote a white paper on it in which he considered the combination of those two to probably be the most dangerous science and technological and philosophical concepts in the history of mankind, which he believes could very quickly lead to an extinction level event. The Birkbeck Law School in Britain is one of the most famous law schools uh, on earth for teaching CSI students, crime scene investigators. And they put out a press release about 18 months ago now in which they said that they will need to design future classes for crime scene analysis which has been perpetrated by something that is only part human. The whole point was that everything we know about forensics, about profiling, might not apply if we're trying to track down a serial rapist who is part wolf because he may have a bloodlust, he may have a difference, his mindset, his instincts, everything about him may not fit anything that we understand. Uh, and this is considered to be such a real possibility, by the way, it isn't just the Birkbeck Law School. This last year in California, a, a House Foreign Affairs Committee hearing in the state of California that was chaired by Democrat Brad Sherman, who's actually best known for his expertise in the spread of nuclear arms among terrorists, chaired this meeting. A writer for Congressional Quarterly, Mark Stenzel, attended the meeting and came out of it flabbergasted because what the meeting was all about is future terrorism conducted by transhumans. And he said that the, the entire hearing, a, a, a congressional hearing, uh, he said sounded more like a pitch for a sci-fi movie than it did a sober discussion of scientific reality because he said they were talking about superhumans, super intelligence, artificial intelligence, and super animals that could soon be on the battlefield or even in our neighborhoods for domestic reasons, a lethal force for which we are not prepared. The government is so concerned about where transhumanism may take us in this regard that they consider this now to be the fledgling start of a new arms race in the way that in the past between the Soviet Union and the United States we were in an arms race over nuclear arms. Transhumanism is the, is the near future arms race and it, is, and it is considered to be of such importance that the top scientific mind at the Pentagon, the Jasons, uh, J-A-S-O-N, that's the name of the top scientific minds at the Pentagon, put out a press release recently called Jason's Fear Brain Modified Foes in which they were talking about this technology in the hands of our enemies. Uh, and what they were saying was, we have to get at the forefront of this technology. See, this is how we're going to be forced into this. It's not a matter of whether we should or whether it's ethical. We have to do it. Because if we don't, our enemies will, and then they're going to subjugate us to their will. And therefore, because of that, that's why DARPA and other branches of the U.S. military and, of course, SAPOC budgets, black budgets, things we don't know anything about. There are literally billions of dollars flowing now beyond congressional review into the development of super soldier technology and other forms of exotic technology as a result of even what the Jasons are talking about. So there, there is this other side of this transhuman utopianism uh, that is very concerning to a lot of great minds. And I can tell you that even on the ground now, already, the parts that are already being played out uh, are raising alarm bells. For instance, a re the related science of genetically modified foods. We are already finding out that by unnaturally crossing over species barriers and creating potatoes that have moth genes in them and other variations of foods, that these foods do things. They have unintended consequences. Uh, tests that are being done now in Britain where they're raising uh, fields of genetically modified crops and downwind the populations are developing respiratory diseases that are unusual, uh, that are starting to skyrocket. There have been suppressed scientific studies. 
Arpad Puzte is one famous case. His studies were supported by another independent scientist by the name of Arena Ermakova, who was able to repeat what he did. What did he find? He took rats and he forced these rats to eat genetically modified foods. They began developing tumorous cancers. Their offspring came in at half weight and died at half life. This was all done in a laboratory setting which was immediately being suppressed by a giant corporation whose name I won't mention, but who literally stands to lose trillions of dollars in the future and therefore they are highly motivated to suppress these findings and only because of Greenpeace and some others who have been involved in, in, in lawsuits for over a decade to force these documents to be made uh, available to the public are we just now being made aware of some of the things uh, that are happening in the real world. One of the test studies showed that they would put rats in a cage and starve them and then they would place genetically modified potatoes here and natural organic potatoes here and when they open the cage doors the rats will run to the organic product and they won't even eat the genetically modified crop unless they're starving and have no other options and then they'll eat it and you gotta wonder what God's little creatures know about these products that we don't know but we very well could be opening a door to a molecular biological nightmare to a crossover between humans and animals or genetic uh, foods that probably not for a decade will we really understand what the impact on our health is going to be with some of this genetic modification. But imagine now, extrapolate what we already are finding about genetically modified crops. And there are many other stories, by the way, that are now coming through into the news that show that genetically modified crops are leading to cancers in humans as well. But where are genetically modified crops? They're everywhere. They're in Kellogg's Corn Flakes. Genetically modified soy is in food products in every store in the United States of America. They, they, this, this bear has already come through the door and there's no putting it back. So now we're riding the bicycle while we build it. The human population is the guinea pig. We're already doing the science and we'll wait and see how it turns out in the future. But imagine when we now take that same approach to living sentient beings. And now we have genetically modified animals and genetically modified humans that are in the environment. And they are crossbreeding and interbreeding one with each other. Very quickly, we could have a human form of mad cow disease. If you're sitting in a restaurant eating goat cheese that contains human DNA, we don't know what the impact of that is going to be on a human. We certainly know what it did to cows and the kinds of brain diseases that it created in them when they were eating their own DNA, when they were eating their own uh, product. We just simply don't know. Prion contamination. Wired Magazine recently wrote a special article called farm animals, P-H-A-R-M, farm animals crank out drugs. And the article was a positive spin on developing pharmaceuticals in transgenic animals. What the public doesn't know is that the writer for Wired Magazine contacted me first and wanted me to be part of that special series at Wired Magazine because they had come across an article that I had written at World Net Daily, which was raising some cautions about you know, tinkering with God's plan. So the writer, Elizabeth Svoboda, contacted me. I like what you have to say. I want my article to be balanced for Wired Magazine. Would you be willing to send me some issues, nutshell some issues, that you believe should be you know, the cautionary side of this science? So I did. I sent it to Elizabeth Svoboda. About three weeks later, when the article was published by Wired Magazine, nothing I had said made it into the article. It was all positive about farm animals, P-H-A-R-M. So I emailed Elizabeth and I said, well, I guess nothing I said uh, got written into the article. She said, no, everything you said was in the article and it got censored out by the editors at Wired Magazine because they didn't want the public to be bothered by these issues. They wanted to put a positive spin on it. Well, then I knew, I went back and read the article and I knew she was telling me the truth because there was a particular line that I had used in which I said, we might want to be careful tinkering with God's plan. That's a very specific phrase. Uh, when I went back and read the article, I saw where a scientist by the name of Vandalavor said, now some people might say we shouldn't be tinkering with God's plan, but, she said, if we find a cure for cancer through a transgenic animal, we won't hear the public saying you shouldn't be doing that. I didn't do it, but I wanted to email Miss Vandalavor and say, have you watched the movie with w Will Smith, I Am Legend? 
because that is exactly the scenario with which that film opens. You have a, a molecular biologist or a geneticist sitting in front of a television on somebody's talk show saying, we have found the cure for cancer. How did they find the cure? They, 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 they merged human and animal DNA because some animals are more resilient to cancer. And out of that, they created a vaccine. And they vaccinated all of the earth and everybody celebrated that we have found the cure to cancer. Now the scene changes and it's two or three years down the road and almost all life on earth is dead. Why? The unintended consequence, a form of human rabies developed because something that was not natural to us now was bridged into our physiology by crossing over into the animal kingdom. And by the way, that is a very real scientific possibility, but it isn't stopping anybody. We're doing it anyway. So there definitely is two sides to this coin uh, in terms of what transhumanists are aspiring to through the use of these new sciences, biotechnology, nanotechnology, neuropharmacology. They all have great ology names and ism names, um, but what they, what they may do is lead us literally into the fulfillment of biblical prophecy.